um, different topics when, when looking at maps and things like that. Um, another example as we move throughout the year is a globalization debate and this actually goes along with the interdisciplinary projects that Steve was just referring to because one idea we have at our school is that while the seventh grade social studies students are working on globalization and um, having a debate, we have the English teachers teaching argument writing and using globalization as their topic as well. So we're kind of doing an interdisciplinary unit there um, and we even have students, well we plan this year to have students use pieces of the live debates that we're going to watch to include in their debates. Um, the next activity is on iCivics.org which has a ton of great stuff on it and what I found to be the most engaging especially for our seventh grade students, is um, an interactive game called Do I Have a Right? And it's where the students actually get to create their own law firm. Um, and they have clients come in and they get to decide if they have a constitutional right or not. So uh, we always share this game with them around Constitution Day. Um, and they have a lot of fun with it, but there's so much more on that website. It didn't list everything, but it's really um, a great resource to use. And then Sarah Sharkey, who also teaches seventh grade social studies, is going to talk about the CNN student news. Hi, uh, CNN student news, if you're not familiar with it, is a daily news program designed for middle and high school students. It's currently offering an ongoing series that explores both the U.S. presidential election process in general and, of course, this particular presidential election. The one thing that's good about it is they, they have um, archive their episodes, and so, for instance, the September 2nd episode, uh, a segment of it was devoted to the uh, Electoral College and how that works, and it's, um, the way it's written makes it accessible to, you know, 7th through 12th graders. Jen, back to you. Okay, so the next section that I included is just a way for um, teachers that are teaching world regions and especially ancient civilizations, which Sarah and I teach, is to really tie back when you talk about the, um, you know, democ the birth of democracy, um, the, the, their systems of voting and their systems of leadership. Um, I, I think it's, that's a really good place to bring in what we've taken from them and how we've evolved it and how our system has changed and that's sort of where I really take the opportunity to bring in a lot of civics in that area because sometimes with world regions um, it becomes a little bit more difficult to find places so that's definitely where I really focus on it. Uh, and then the last piece I included is iSideWith.com which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of already but I found that even in seventh grade my students are able to become more familiar with some of the issues. Um, they can go on this website and answer questions that lets them know based on your responses this is the presidential candidate or um, not even just candidates, any political leaders, government leaders that, that they might side with on certain issues and it lets them know um, based on how they feel, what party they might be um, involved in, or just in general who they agree with. So it's kind of a nice resource to get them a little bit more informed in that sense. And that's pretty much what we have for uh, middle school. Okay, uh, Rianne, uh, a teacher, a very fine high school teacher, Rianne from Amity Region High School. Rianne, uh, take it away. Great. Okay, so at the high school level, we really like the idea of students being involved in the community and interacting with members of the community. So one of the first things that is um, pretty easy to do is to have students actually get involved in candidates' campaigns. You can have students volunteer on a campaign. It could be, you know, one of the presidential campaigns. They certainly get a lot of attention and there's certainly local branches and offices for students. But also even the town offices and candidates that are running and even those running for the Connecticut General Assembly are always looking for student volunteers. So we like to have our students volunteer for anywhere between five and maybe ten hours on a political campaign. But in addition to doing that volunteering, we ask that they conduct some research about the candidate and the campaign issues. They really scrutinize how the candidates um, use campaign techniques. And then they reflect on their own experiences and their views of politics. If we believe in the concept that all politics is local, students really get a sense of how much they can do or how much local politicians have 
um, an impact on their lives. So that is something that our students really benefit from year after year, not just in presidential campaign years. In addition, um, we like to have our students create presidential campaign commercials in presidential election years. And we like to do it in conjunction with film class students. You have a little bit of that interdisciplinary connection, but actually film students and social studies students working together and collaborating. And we have students start out by actually analyzing influential campaign commercials of the past, like Daisy Girl or Morning in America or Willie Horton. And they look for, you know, what are some really effective techniques used in the past? And then when they create their own campaign commercials, <laughs> those campaign commercials need to contain some type of voice or theme. They need to have a minimum of two election issues and be true to the candidate's style while infusing the candidate's character. And if you really want to um, meet multiple criteria for this red, white, and blue schools rubric, you can have teachers maybe select finalists of some of the best campaign commercials and then have the whole school view them and also vote on them as a way to, to really get some ideas, not just across to those students participating, but students in the whole school. And for those uh, schools that have local access channels or even just a, a website, they can actually post winners right on the website to actually reach out to community members as well. And then finally, one thing that we have actually found to be incredibly beneficial to our students, and we were surprised at how easy it is to make this happen, is we ask local candidates to come in and speak to our students. And even though most of our students can't vote, it's an opportunity for those candidates to still in some way kind of reach out to some families and districts, particularly when they're running for election. And we have students before the candidates come in and speak research local or state issues, and then use the question formulation technique to generate questions for candidates. And if you're not familiar with the question formulation technique, it's a fabulous method to have students really generate questions and revise questions collaboratively. And the rightinstitute.org actually has a lot of information on how to do that. Once the candidates come in and they visit the school and students ask their questions and candidates respond. Students are, are kind of taught how to ask follow-up questions in respectful ways. We ask that our students reflect on their overall impressions of the candidates, including how did they look, how, what was their knowledge of the issues, their stance on the issues, how well did they connect to their audience, um, and they predict whether candidates will be successful or not on election day. And it's very interesting because our students get more of an up-close and personal look at these candidates than most of the public does. And sometimes it seems so clear to them who's going to win an election, and then the vote actually goes in a different direction. But most individuals don't get to sit maybe in a setting with 30 people and talk one-on-one -on -one with a candidate and have that candidate be accountable to them. But, but it's a really valuable experience, and students very often from those candidates coming in and speaking, especially because we do ask them to volunteer on campaigns, they often pick the candidate that they most identify with and then and then seek that candidate out to volunteer on their campaign. So that's it being, you know, a little bit of quid pro quo and, and, a, and a mutually beneficial um, experience for everyone involved. So those are just some of the things that we do at Amity High School. Great, great. Thank you, Lynn. And you know what, how about at this point, Gordon is on. And so, uh, Gordon, we, um, how about if we give you, you got the mic, what do you do at the elementary school level? Oh, hello, thank you. Um, the first thing I started with was uh, getting a map of the town for every classroom. And the way I went about that was going to uh, mailamap.com where they provide all of these maps of the town for free. And we get the kids uh, thinking about what their town is, what the size is, putting pins where their houses are, having them trace their path to school, and then finding, well, in our town it's easy, the local voting place and where the town hall is, or city hall if it was a larger city, and getting them an idea of where people will come from to do some voting. And there's a lot of activities that can go with it, but that's one of the ways that we get started and just get kids to understand uh, 
the geography of where they live and who makes decisions where they are. Uh, the next thing that I posted here was how to become a president. It's a, a poster that's provided by the U.S. government, but it gives a very interesting sequence wherein it talks about they have to be a natural born citizen. They have to have a certain, be there, uh, be a certain age. They have to um, uh, have lived in the country for a certain number of years continuously. And it also leaves out other details that the kids might presuppose, such as gender or race. So with that poster, the kids could then follow the uh, election cycle. They can go back and fill it in and create their own timeline based on that and, and check with the different candidates where they fit into each of those qualifiers. And then the last part is what does it mean to be a responsible community member? Fortunately for us at our school, the town hall is adjacent to the school. So we could have our first select woman over to talk to the kids and meet with them. In fact, her grandkids go here. So that makes it easy. But for, for other schools where it's larger, you could easily do, uh, and I heard Leanne mentioning this, get people who are already in office to come over and talk about what their job is and how they are a, a leader and what does that entail and what is their job like on a daily basis and how they got there to give them, the kids an idea of what, 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 um, what they're voting for on a local level, and then we build it up from there. Could I ask the, um, the, the Amity teachers that are on, would, would you feel comfortable, um, do you sense, as I hear from my job, folks, that this is a difficult election to teach, that Trump and, 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 you know, and Hillary and all the bad language and all this, do you find that to be true? And if so, how would you counter that? I know at the high school level, I think it actually makes it easier, believe it or not, um, in that most people have heard something, most students have heard something about it or seen, you know, some headlines or watched some meme on social media um, or, or saw some clip. So in many ways, it makes it easier. Um, but then from there to kind of break it down into real issues and what that really is going to look like, in a way, can be a bit more challenging, but I think the hook is already here in the election. I think our community is very accepting of us presenting different viewpoints and challenging students in different ways, so we don't deal with a lot of resistance in that regard. I suppose in, I've heard and I've, I've sat at other state meetings or with students in other schools where they talk about how their um, their communities don't want to raise anything controversial because they're concerned about how parents of the community might react. But I think as long as you present information in a, in a balanced way and you give students some criteria on how to evaluate or ask students what they feel their criteria should be to evaluate candidates, I think um, it, it's really incredibly helpful. I mean, they're bombarded with information on social media and actually teasing out what's just, you know, a one-liner and what's really a political stance and what that can mean for America, I think is an incredibly valuable skill, quite frankly, not just for students, but probably for some adults, too. I agree with Leanne. I think that um, it, it's definitely true that the hook is already there. In in middle school, a lot of years, the students won't even know who the candidates are at this point in the election, and this year they definitely do. And I think what's important to do at the middle school level is when they, they bring up um, the media part of it and the one-liners, as Leanne said, is say, okay, well, that was their statement, but let's look at what their stance actually is and what the platform says and kind of turn it around to, you know, bring it back to the issues rather than what the media is focusing on. Could, could I ask you a question? Or I, I would ask any, any of you this question. I was visiting late last week in a class. It was a fifth grade class, and they were talking about the election. And a kid, I don't think it was meant, it was a legitimate question. A kid asked this question. Why does whenever Donald Trump talks about Hillary Clinton, he calls her Hillary, uh, crooked Hillary? Why is that? 
Could I ask how you would answer that question if the kid asked that in your class? Well, at the high school level, I, we would turn it back to the students and have the students attempt to answer that question. Um, so I think, and then we can of course guide them, but if they're not, you know, quite understanding the concept, but in general, most high school students can pick up on the persuasive techniques being used. So um, I think the other thing we would do, with the, we do, and would do at the high school level, is also help students understand that while this election can be inflammatory and there are a lot of one-liners and there are a lot of insults. It's certainly not the only election in U.S. history for that to have happened and for cheap shots to have been taken. So kind of looking back at history and showing examples, not just of campaign commercials, but even, you know, Andrew Jackson, um, I think is also helpful for students to not just understand this is not just a one-time event, although it may feel like it and it's easier to reach um, mass numbers of people through social media. Um, this is a tactic used often in politics, and I think there's huge benefits in, in students understanding that as well. Are you implying, are you implying, Leanne, that 2016 is not the first year that a candidate insulted another candidate? <laughs> just a slight implication, Steve, just a slight one. <laughs> but it's funny because, you know, Kids look on social media and, and so do adults. I don't mean to just like um, to speak of kids in this manner and students of this manner, but they look at social media for information or they look at John Oliver for information and not seeing the difference between entertainment and information. And I think um, that is a huge part of our job as educators right now to help students see the difference. Yes, John Oliver is entertaining. Yes, John Stewart of long, you know, of the past used to be entertaining. And even, quite frankly, some of our, you know, considered, you know, news programming on MSNBC or Fox News, it's also entertaining as well as, you know, supposedly informative. But really helping students see those differences, I really feel is a, a critical aspect of our job right now to not just see you know, a meme of Hillary Clinton and think, oh, you know, that's it and it's a joke. Good point. It's, um, it's, you know, uh, you know, before uh, Gloria and we were talking before about some of the great partners that you want to work with, and there's somebody on here, uh, Bambi Moreau, from the Women's Hall of Fame. And um, I'm wondering, Bambi, if you might be able to to speak just for a second about what you offer and what you might be able to do with schools. And I hope Bambi is on. Maybe not, we'll get her on in a second. Um, could, could, I, could I just say, by the way, if anybody has questions, I think everybody got a copy of the rubric for the competitions. So if anybody has a question on the rubrics, um, what we can do is I can uh, we can um, I can answer those. So if you have questions on the rubric, if you'd be gracious enough just to write them in the chat box, then we try to answer them. But just so you know about the competition, and, um, you know we're going to send out by the middle of October the criteria what you'd have to send in if your school is going to enter, and I really hope it will. And then in April, there's a, there'll be a committee of teachers and educators that will evaluate these and will determine if your school should be recognized. All right, and you'll get a notification in, in April. And then we'll have a ceremony, a fairly large ceremony actually, for all schools that get this. In, 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 it's either going to be in late April or May of 2017. Again, we're going to have one school who will win quote unquote win in each category, but we want a lot of schools participating and we want a lot of schools to get recognition. And, and, and again, to repeat, if you want to know what we're looking for, check out those rubrics that I sent you. If you want to know um, some more about it and how to submit and all, that'll go out in uh, another three or four weeks. So just uh, to start finishing up here, you know, we're very excited here at the Secretary of State's office to be partnering with the Department of Education 
on this program. I think it's going to be really exciting to work with students of all levels and teachers to kind of share all of our shared missions. Uh, and it's going to be very hands on project. And, you know, we hopefully able to see more than you know, kids often know, like, oh, it's just learning in the classroom and they want it to show that it's just a lot more than that. And we want this to be something that happens every year. This isn't just a one you know, year project and then it's over. You know, we really want uh, this to be something that you know, teachers, students, and schools all aspire to achieve. Um, and then it becomes you know, something very um, worthwhile and it's important for everyone uh, to accomplish. So we are really excited and looking forward to this. And, you know, like you just said, you know, there isn't any, and all of this is that the teachers here, that, you know, there's no bad ideas. It's just, you know, re reaching out and, you know, using each other to kind of bounce ideas off of each other and reach out to us. Um, and, that, you know, feel free to ask if you have any questions. So, thank you. Could I ask um, Val McVeigh, who's uh, a, a real one of the real experts in civic ed? She lives in Connecticut. She's involved in social studies in Connecticut, but a lot of her work is in Florida. Val, if you're on, I think I unmuted you. Would you have any comments on this, on what you would recommend schools doing or anything like that? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. We can. Okay. Um, I, I think I would just reiterate the great ideas that the three teachers shared during this call. There's so many resources online that are helpful. Certainly, iCivics.org is um, one organization that's putting forth their game, Win the White House, and that's a simulation you can do in one class period or more that takes kids through an entire presidential campaign from primaries to election day. Um, and I work with iCivics pretty closely, so if you want more information on their programs or support on that, you can contact me. Um, just another big piece of advice would be to engage in a formal mock election program. Work with the National Student Parent Mock Election or reach out to Kids Voting um, and find out if there is a program you can bring to your school. It's really neat for students to be able to cast a mock ballot and then be able to compare how their choice um, stacked up next to a national outcome or a state outcome. But lots of great ideas being shared today. Could, could I share um, two other things that may or may not be interesting to you, I hope they are, is that one of them is that we, um, one of them is that we're going to have um, a three-part webinar series on teaching the 2016 elections. And this is going to go more in detail into content, into some themes to talk about, but also into some teaching strategies and materials, sort of like we are doing today. The webinars will be on Wednesdays from 3.30 to 4.30. Again, the topic is teaching the 2016 elections. So if you're interested in that, um, please start next Wednesday. And, uh, please sign up. Just email me and I'll get you on to the link so you can take part. But we think these are going to be very interesting and compelling uh, webinars and we hope you join. Another thing is that the uh, Commissioner of Education is interested in having, and I think I emailed many of you this, having a public event celebrating the Red, White, and Blue School program. So if you, um, if you or your school is doing something cool associated with the elections in the next couple of weeks, in the next month, if you're doing a candidate forum, if you're doing a voting drive, if you're doing any kind of event, um, could you email me that, when it is, where it is? And hopefully we can get the Commissioner of Education and maybe some and some press down to see what we do. So those are two upcoming events we hope that you consider. Yes, sir. Is both the webinar series on teaching the elections, and a lot of it again is going to be content, you know, what themes to talk about and things like that. But it's going to be some of what we talked about today. And the other thing I hope in this group there'd be a person or two who might volunteer their school or their district for the. Um, 
for a public event to celebrate the red, white, and blue schools program that the Commissioner of Education would attend. So we would invite anybody and everybody to take part in both of those things. As I said before, specific details on how to submit for this program will be going out by the end of the month, by uh, October 1st at the absolute latest. Everybody that's on this webinar will get notable. And as I said before, you'll also tomorrow all get a copy of the PowerPoint that we use today, if that would be helpful in any way for you or your district. Does anyone have questions? If you do, write them in the chat box, um, and I, we try to answer them. Again, if you want to get started with your district, as I hope you would, the rubrics that we sent out would give you, hopefully, some ideas how to do it some ideas of what we'd be looking for. And, um, and, and so that would be, um, that's a way to get started. And we'll be in communication with you more as we go through our department. Um, Anamity crew, any last words from you that you'd like to give us? No, um, I think we view this as just a wonderful program to really encourage students to be more involved civically. And as you said, while, you know, one school at each, you know, level will be recognized as a blue ribbon school, I mean, we're not in competition with each other, really. It's, it's all about the more students participate statewide, the more informed citizenry we have in Connecticut, and what a benefit that is to all of us. So we're very excited about the initiative, and you know, you're more than welcome to contact us individually as well um, if you have any questions or um, need any help along the way. And could I also pitch one other event while we're here? Is the Connecticut Council for the Social Studies is having their annual conference on Monday, October 17th. And it's going to be at the Crown Plaza in Cromwell. And there will be a session on the Red, White, and Blue Schools program. So hopefully, um, that you, hopefully that we'll see you there. And if you want to do a workshop, they still are taking workshop proposals. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, last time, Bambi, are you on or no? I'm on. Can you hear me? I can, Bambi. I wanted you to pitch what you can offer to schools. Can you? Could you tell them a little about your organization and what you can do for schools? Sure. So um, I'm the Director of Education at the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, as Steve mentioned, and we do educational programs on a variety of topics that are all free of charge for schools across Connecticut. Um, we have uh, several things that would really fit in well with the Red, White, and Blue initiative, including our um, DIY history module that's called Votes for Women. So it focuses on Connecticut women who were active in the suffrage movement as well as their legacy in the lives of Connecticut's female political pioneers. So people like Ella Grasso, people like State Treasurer Denise Napier, those, um, those sorts of folks. Um, and what the program really does is it puts the resources in the hands of the teachers um, to download and use in the ways that make the most sense for the classroom. So that's really geared toward grades 6 to 12, and that's downloadable through our website. Um, it's free. You have to register. It takes, you know, 30 seconds to register, and then you can access it um, at your leisure. We also have a series of um, in-school programs where we'll have guest speakers that will come into your classroom to talk about um, a variety of topics, but on this particular, um, in this particular area, um, things like uh, uh, our powerful voices, Connecticut Women Changing Democracy talk would be perfect. Um, again, talking about the women from Connecticut who have been active in the electoral process and shaping our state, our nation, and our world. Um, and then finally, I'll mention this. We are going to be hosting a special event at the end of March next year, um, coinciding with Women's History Month that we're calling Girls Day at the Capitol. And that will be a full day event for girls in grades 8 to 12 to come and interact with elected officials, um, hear about how to run for office, talk about different ways that they can get involved in um, grassroots organizing and lobbying efforts on various issues, and also, um, of course, their right to vote and why and how they should exercise that going forward. So we're very excited about that um, 
and we'll be you'll probably many of you will, are already on our email list and so you'll be getting information about that but we'll be looking to recruit some schools to participate that day um, and send some delegations of young women Bambi, if somebody doesn't know how do they get hold of you um, they can go on our website, which is cwhf.org, um, and they can find all of our contact information there. Um, they can also, if, if you just Google Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, we'll come right up. And if you go on the staff page, my direct contact information is there as well. Thank you. There was a question from somebody on how to get, if you teach in a big district, or you're involved in a big district, how to get the district involved? Well, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's different answers to that. I might suggest that don't try to get, if you're going to just start this in a district that has 50 schools or something, don't think, don't try to do it with 50 schools. I think I'd find an interested teacher in maybe one of two schools. Start with this, start with them. Start with the fine water. Welcome to the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame, a virtual museum to enrich our knowledge. Uh oh, somebody went, hey, hey, Bambi, that's good. Somebody went to the website. <laughs> yes, I heard our founding president in the background. <laughs> But, but again, on the issue of, of the, if you're in a district, don't try to get every school involved. It's, you know, to repeat, there's, there's, I think the way to start programs like this is oftentimes find one or two interested teachers and go from there. Okay. Um, one other person that just would, would, I'd like to have speak just for a second is Tina uh, from the um, Secretary of State's office who has a couple words as well. Thank you. Um, I thank you for introducing me. I'm uh, glad to see we've got so many participants on, on the webinar and I apologize for um, coming on a little late, but um, I'm sure a lot of stuff's already been covered. I just wanted to, on behalf of Secretary Merrill, um, offer our agency support as well, you know, perhaps as a connector between partner organizations and schools if a school happens to be looking for partners. So um, I just want to put that out there as well. Thanks. Thank you. So can I, as, as I would always say in an event like this or a webinar like this, if I can help you in your district, please email me. Um, again, four things. I will email you this webinar tomorrow. Please consider having your, your school hosting an event, celebrating the Red, White, and Blue program. Uh, email me if you've got some ideas on that. Hope some of you will sign up for the Teaching the 2016 Elections webinar. And we hope that uh, some of you or all of you will go to the Connecticut Council Conference on October 10th. So you know what? It's, how about that? It's, well, we started a little late, but it's 4.30, so that's probably probably a good place to stop for today. So um, again, if you have any other questions, please ask. And Mariah, um, thanks for taking part in it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for participating. And um, have a good day, folks. We will be in touch soon. Take care.